The Bible tells us that God commendeth or showed his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And that's about Calvary and how he died for the sinner. He died for you, he died for me. And if you ever doubt whether or not God loves you, then just go back to Calvary. And that, that settles it right there. That God's love for you is not based on your feelings or your thoughts or my feelings or thoughts. That's up and down and all around some days, right? But the fact is, is that he loves you unconditionally and demonstrated that love uh, by dying in your place. In fact, that's exactly where we're going uh, this morning. And so I appreciate all the good music again that we've been, in, been blessed to enjoy for sure. So <clears throat> uh, just a couple things. Our, our dear friend, Miss Debbie Starks, went home to be with the Lord this past week. Longtime member here at Southwest. Mentioned that on Wednesday night, but some weren't here uh, for that announcement, perhaps. Uh, just wanted to mention there's a visitation today at Vondel Smith on a Southwest uh, 119th. That'd be the South Lakes location. I believe it's from noon till 8, so those times are available. I think the family's going to be there from 3 to 5 at least, and Brother Jim no doubt will be there, her husband. Pray for him, if you would, and the family. And uh, thank God for Miss Debbie. And the funeral will be on Monday, so that's tomorrow, right here at 2 p.m. So just make uh, mindful of that. And uh, sure, thanking God for the missions conference that we had last week. Don't want to forget what God did there and rejoice in that. But we also have some other things coming up here. We have college days this week. Would you pray for that? We have about 500 guests. That would include workers and well, I hope there's workers uh, and teenagers coming. And uh, so it'd be a good, a good number here uh, for college days. So sure, looking forward to hosting them here Wednesday night and then the rest at Heartland Baptist Bible College. Alfred King will be preaching, so pray for Alfred. He pastors down in Arizona, and I think he'll be a real blessing, no doubt, uh, there. Good to have Pastor Seth Hohenstreet and his wife here. Just raise your hand, Brother Seth, and glad to have them here from Idaho. And then Matt Grimes, Pastor Matt Grimes, right back here. We got acquainted during the uh, Ministry Refresher Institute, Georgia. Am I thinking right, Brother Grimes, that you pastor there? And so glad he could be with us in the service this morning, along with everybody else as guest here. We're glad to welcome each and every one. It's a real blessing. We like having guests here. It really is. It's a blessing and, and thankful uh, to God for that. Good to see Brother Rob and Miss Amy Gascoigne here this morning as well, and thankful for them and their friendship uh, to Southwest. All right, well, let's, uh, let's do this this morning. We're going to go to a couple passages of Scripture, one on the way to our text. So we're going to be in Genesis chapter 1 to start, Genesis 1, and then we're going to find Hebrews 2. So if you could stand in honor of God's Word, find those two passages of Scripture, then we'll uh, get back to our series here in the book of Hebrews, <clears throat> Fulfilled in Christ. Fulfilled in Christ. You're not going to find fulfillment apart from him. But you'll find fulfillment in him. Um, and a little play on words there in the sense that all of the Old Testament is pointing forward to his coming. And thus uh, all the prophecies and even the types and the pictures, the offerings. In fact, uh, another thing I was going to mention is that as a church family, you observe the Lord's Supper on Tuesday night. It's an off night just for a church family. Uh, we observe and remember his death, his burial, but thank God for this, his resurrection. But all those types, all the blood shed in the Old Testament was pointing forward to Mount Calvary where Jesus would die in our place. And so we're, we're making an effort this Sunday and next to get ready for that remembrance. And then, of course, Resurrection Sunday, the following, uh, following Sunday. So all that is coming upon us here in the month of March. Okay, Genesis chapter number 1 and uh, verse number 26. Genesis 1 and verse 26. I just wanted you to see this on our way to Hebrews. So Genesis 1, verse number 26, and we'll read verse number 27 as well. And God said, let us make man in our image. You are not the product of evolutionary Amen. happenings. Not at all. No, you are the design of an all-knowing, all-wise creator God. He said, let us make man in our image. 
after our likeness, it goes on. And let them, notice this, let them have what? Dominion. dominion. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Get rid of some, right? <laughs> Anyways, dominion. Verse 27. <clears throat> so... God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Notice this, male and female created he them. Both equally in the image of God. And jointly, if we read on in chapter two, I just did some premarital counseling yesterday and used Genesis two. And talked about uh, how that God made them male and female and brought them together as husband and wife. And they would have dominion and work and toil and, and serve their creator by working in the garden. Then chapter 3 comes and sin enters the picture as they sinned against God. They had one commandment and they broke that commandment. Okay, so now with that brief summary in mind. Let's go to Hebrews chapter number two, if you would. So I wanted you to see that God made man and according to his original design, <clears throat> pardon me, then man was to have dominion, to rule, to have creation in his subjection. And that, that is also tied into the fact that God made man in his image. Okay. So how's that going for us? <laughs> Not so swell, huh? All right, well, Hebrews addresses that. For the sake of time, we'll just read our text. And then what I'd like to do is take a good run at it in the message and maybe hit a few high points in chapter 1. Um, and so that's what we're going to do. But right now we're at Hebrews 2 and verse 5. <clears throat> Hebrews 2 and verse number 5. <clears throat> For unto the angels... For unto the angels hath he, that being God, hath he not put in what? Subjection. Do you see it? So he's not given the world to, to come to the subjection of the angels. Angels aren't going to be in charge. That's what he's saying. All right, let me read it again. For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak, but one in a certain place, testified, saying, and then he actually quotes from Psalm 8. I didn't have his turn there, but Psalm 8 is actually built on Genesis 1 that we did read. What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? I, it would probably help to know that David is saying, when I consider the work of thy fingers, the sun and the moon and the stars, all of creation. What is man? For now and then when I'm flying in an airplane, you look down and you see these little things going along. Semi-trucks. They look big when they're coming past you. But from up there, they don't look very big. What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man. What is man? I'm sorry that thou art mindful of him. Or the son of man that thou visitest him. Verse 7 now. Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou madest him, a, is that what it said? Yeah. Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor. And did have set him, man, right? He set him over the works of thy hands. Thou, verse 8 now, thou hast put all things in what? Subjection. Could we say dominion? Is that a synonym, related word? Sure. Uh, thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him. He left nothing that is not put under him. But now, the writer of Hebrews says, but now we see not yet all things put under him. 
Everybody following along so far? Right now, we don't see everything under man's dominion. Verse 9, but we see Jesus. <laughs> but we see Jesus, watch this now, follow along very carefully, who was made a little lower than the angels. Is that what it said? Yep. Who was made a little lower than the angels. For what purpose? For the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for the elect. Did I misread that? For every man. That's what it said. I wonder what it means. Just what it said. Every man. Well, that'll blow some theological system crafted in the 16th century out of the water. If that's the century it was created in. Verse 10. For it became him, talking about Jesus, it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things, watch this, in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain, the same word captain is used in Hebrews 12 too, the author of their salvation, same word, the captain of their salvation, perfect through, notice this, sufferings. So this morning, with God's help, I'd like to preach on this passage a good bit and fill in some of the gaps that maybe not were, that were not clear in the reading. It's the purpose of preaching and to make application. On this, this uh, title, The Sufferings of the Son of God. The Sufferings of the Son of God. Through Jesus, you can live a Genesis 1 and 2 life in a Genesis 3 world. Through Jesus, you can live a Genesis 1 and 2 life in a Genesis 3, Genesis 3 world. God, uh, please help us here. Um, there's a lot of moving parts to this passage, and I've tried to take time to study it, understand it, prepare it, and now that comes the time to preach it. So please help in the explanation, the application, and then even in many ways, the most importantly, the invitation that God, someone here not saved would be saved and that those that are saved would be living the type of life that you originally designed. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing for a good bit there. <clears throat> There's several examples of this, but when something is restored, brought back to its original design... That'd be a good definition of restored, uh, or even better, right? When something is restored, it comes at a high price. Um, we bought a house that was built in 1963, and so we restored that, and in the process still thereof a little bit, but most has been done. Or we ran out of money <laughs> and time and skill and talent. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, restoring a house, that takes a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of money. It does. Restoring a piece of furniture, uh, perhaps. Uh, restoring a vehicle. Some of you have, are much more mechanically inclined than I ever will be or even dream to be. And, and there are men and, uh, and ladies here that have been a part of that, restoring, you know, maybe a, I, I think about Brother Seth Bailey, restored his granddad's uh, uh, 1970. Four or something like that, uh, pickup truck, I believe it's a Chevy, if I'm not mistaken. And, and my soul is beautiful now. And, and so anyways, it's just a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of money that goes into restoring uh, something. But let me, let me just get right to it here today. Restoring you back to your original design came at the ultimate price. And is an ongoing effort 
on the part of the God who loves you enough to pay the ultimate price for you. And he loves you just the way you are. But we say it often around here because it continues to be true that God loves you just the way you are, but he loves you way too much to leave you that way. And when he saves you, he begins a process of spiritual growth and change to change you into the image of his dear son because whom he did foreknow them, he also did predestinate. Hey, listen, the word predestination is in the Bible, but it's not like the Calvinists would use it to say that it, he predestinated to save a certain group. No, listen, friend, he, he predestinated that those that are saved would be changed into the image of his dear son. Restoration. Uh, the title might, I mean, the, the title and the subtitle obviously are working together, but, but you, you might think, well, most of our message today is going to be talking about restoration and having dominion. What does the suffering have to do with? Well, there, there's a major connection here that we're going to try to make out of the text because it goes right into it as to what God's original design was and how we get there. But as I was beginning study on this, as, as in the earlier part of the week, I began to study verses 9 and 10 and, of course, was just drawn to the suffering of the Son of God. In fact, on March the 15th, my Bible reading program or my Bible uh, program that I use to study has uh, verses that it uses each day, and it talked about Jesus and his suffering, and it talked about how that it you quoted Hebrews 2, perfect through suffering. And then it quoted this about Jesus, how he said, my soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death, tarry here and watch with me. And he went a little further, the Bible says, and fell on his face and saying, oh, my father, if it be possible that this cup pass from me. And friend, what he was talking about there in that garden of Gethsemane, as his soul was pressed out of measure, was he was looking ahead to the very near future when he would die on that cross. And it was not the physical pain of the, the nails being driven through his hands and through his feet and the spear driven through his side and the crown of thorns that was placed upon his head. No, but it was your sin and my sin that was placed upon him. The sin of all humanity, of all time, placed upon him all at one time. And the, and the sun was darkened and, and there, was, there was darkness over the whole earth because our sin was upon the sinless Son of God. I'm talking to you this morning about the suffering that was necessary for you and I, uh, for you and me to be saved. The Bible says that he is despised and rejected in Isaiah 53. Years before Jesus came, he is despised and rejected of being a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And yet we, is, we hid as if it were our faces from him. He is despised and we esteemed him not. He was chastened for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. Why did he have to do that? Well, this text certainly gives the reason as to why as we look into it, but it has everything to do with God's original design for you. You see, we read the verses, but we didn't spend a lot of time in them, but in, in Genesis chapter number one, it talks about how that God made man in his image, male and female, created he, him, them in his image. And I, I want to say to you this morning that he made you, he made you to fellowship with him. That's why he made you in his image. You see, dogs can't fellowship with God. I know I may be messing up somebody's theology here who thinks all dogs go to heaven, but I'm just simply sorry. But <laughs> I love dogs. Had a bunch of them. But a man and a dog are not the same. Cats aren't the same. Definitely not going there. Horses aren't the same. <laughs> hey, God made you different. Right. He made you in his image. He made you for fellowship. Yeah. And, but part of that also, according to the original design, is that you would have dominion, that you would have the opportunity to bring creation into subjection. And, and so we're going to get to that. I, in fact, it brought back to my mind how my dad told me, I want you to walk walk the dogs along the way. We had coon hounds as I was growing up. I've already mentioned my Kentucky roots and they come out every now and then. This is one of those times, but we had, we had red bone and blue and, and, and we had a uh, Walker dogs and black and tan, but we had one dog that was a, that, that was a, a brindle looking dog. And, and, uh, it was a bear dog actually, but we used him as a plot hound and we called him Mona Me. Mon ami, if you speak French, if I'm not mistaken, means my friend. Mon ami was not always my friend. 
I would be walking this crazy dog, and man, he was so powerful. I mean, just like grabbing earth and pulling it and, and pulling me. I'm 10 or 11 years old. I'd go this way around the tree. He's going that way around the tree, and he's jerking me all around, pulling me through thickets. But there I was having dominion. <laughs> Got it? God made man. As I was sitting yesterday and across the desk from me, uh, Brother Jacob and Haley uh, were wanting to get married. Jacob Grieve and, and uh, Miss Haley Brees and and uh, I said to them, listen, you can live a Genesis 2 life in a Genesis 3 world. They're right here. Raise your hand. They think they want to get married. <laughs> no, they do. They know they want to. Is that right? You still want to get married? I didn't talk to you out of it yesterday. Okay, good. <laughs> hey, we started in Genesis 2. And listen, everything was just so perfect there, wasn't it? So perfect. But then sin enters in, and, and my soul, what a change in chapter number three is, man, now is, is he's working the ground by the sweat of his brow and the thorns and the thistles that are there, and, and, and then there's strife between the husband and the wife. And I mean, this is a Genesis 3 world in which we live, isn't it? And yet God can help you live. Are you listening to me here this morning? A Genesis 1 and 2 life in a Genesis 3 world. Okay, so now what, what does this have to do with, with Hebrews? Okay, so why does he go there? Well, w- would you please go the rest of the journey here with me in this, in this message? Because I want you to see this, that, that the, the case that is m- primarily being made here, and, and, and I'm not trying to take something and use it in a different way than what it's used. No, it's right here in the text. But the case that is primarily being made here is simply this. Jesus is superior to all. He's superior to the angels. He's superior to Moses. He's superior to the law. He's superior to the tabernacle. He's superior to the sacrifices. That's the case that's being made. Look at chapter one, would you please? Chapter number one, as we take a good little run at this, God, verse number one, God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets. Hey, I'm thankful today that God is not a silent God. He speaks to us. He has spoken to us through his word. And right here it says he's spoken to us today through his son. And then he begins, I mean, just right out of the bat to say, hath in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom he made the worlds. He made the worlds. Jesus did. You say, I thought God made the worlds. That's exactly right. So what are you saying? Jesus is God? You got it. He made the worlds. And and, and it goes on. I mean, these are beautiful verses that we don't have time to preach in their entirety. We've already preached them. But but look at what it says here. It, It says, by whom he made the worlds and who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand. Hey, if you sit down, here's what it means. Job is done. The price of your redemption, the the price that was paid for you to be saved, the work needed for you to be saved, already finished, he sat down. The right hand of the throne of God on high, the majesty on high. And and so then what happens, what happens, I want to be, be very clear in the explanation here is this. What happens then is the first two chapters are devoted to showing that Jesus is superior to the angels. And so he has a series of quotations from the Old Testament to show that he's better than the angels because to none of the angels did he say, sit thou here at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say to the angels, and evidently Jesus is not an angel. Because he says to Jesus, thy throne, O God, is eternal in the heavens. That's all in chapter number one. So he makes the case all the way up to verse number 14, okay? Look at verse number 14. He says in verse 14 of chapter 1, are they not all, talking about angels, ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be what? Heirs of salvation. Who's he talking about right there? You and I. He's talking about us. So angels are ministering spirits 
sent to minister for you on your behalf and my behalf. Okay, wait a minute. Follow the logic here. And I know that you can, and I, I just want to make sure that everybody is. Here's what he's saying. Since they are ministers for you and I who are heirs of salvation, then doesn't it stand to reckon or doesn't it stand to reason that if they are ministers, that they are actually inferior to those to whom they serve? And yet in Psalm 8, you say, well, this is kind of conflicting because it says that he made man a little lower than the angels. Well, there's a context of that, and that's what we're looking at. Okay, so now there's a parenthesis that we've already preached in chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Basically, he says this, hey, if you have listened to the word of God, that God used angels to deliver, then how much more should you be very careful to listen to the word that God is delivering to you that the Son of God delivered? If he dealt with people back then in the Old Testament and angels were involved in some of that, that, that delivery of those messages and he dealt with their disobedience, do you think he's going to let you off the hook because now you've got the revelation of the Son of God? <clears throat> Did this go off or did y'all hear that? <laughs> no, listen, friend. Hey, I'm simply saying to you, hey, we're, we're at a place of not less accountability, but greater accountability. The Son of God has manifest things to us. We are without excuse. So he's making the case Jesus is greater than the angels. And the angels are servants even to, of God on the behalf of men. So then he preaches that little mini sermon right there in verses one through four. And he picks up from, the, from chapter one and verse number 14 and he continues his line of thought in chapter two and verse five. See, preachers can do that. <laughs> they can be saying something, then go over here and say something, then get you back to over here to say something else. It's your job to follow. <laughs> All right, now this is an inspired text. Some of my trails are not, <laughs> but I hope they're helpful, right? So that's what he's doing. Now look again at verse five. Verse five says, for unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come. Okay, first thing we ought to notice here is there's a world to come. There's a new heavens and an earth that is coming. Peter talked about that. The book of Revelation speaks about that. The new heaven and the earth, the millennial kingdom, the literal kingdom of Jesus Christ is coming. Angels will not be co-reigning with him. I'm not going to have you turn to these verses, but you do need to also know this, that yes, it is, it is true there is a world to come. And he says here that he didn't put angels in charge of it. In other passages, like Revelation 1, 6, it says this, just listen. He hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and, and dominion forever and ever. Chapter 5, verse 10 of Revelation, he makes this case, and he's made us, the saved, unto our God's kings and priests, and we shall reign on earth. Brothers and sisters in Christ, what does this mean? Well, it means exactly what it's saying. I don't know how to explain it all, but there's coming a time, according to Revelation 20, if you need additional verses, that he saw th thrones and they that sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. Even Paul said that we would judge angels. And, and it says that we would reign with Christ a thousand years and that we would reign with him. Hey, he's going to put us over the earth. I don't know where I'm going to be or where you're going to be. I, I kind of like to pick maybe Colorado or something like that. <laughs> Mountains, I, guess, I don't know. <laughs> Get rid of marijuana. <laughs> Anyways, I'm off track here maybe, but actually maybe I'm on track. But hey, I, I'm, here's the point. Focus. Brother Gaddis, focus. <laughs> he didn't say he was going to have the angels reigning. He said he's going to have man reigning. And that's backed up by Genesis chapter 1, and it's verified by Psalm chapter number 8. And, and as he went in, in fact, Psalm 8 quotes chapter 1 of Genesis. So it's very clear there, and God is concerned about you. 
He's mind, hey, this would be encouraging along the way if I could point out a few more things. According to these verses, in verse number six, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Hey, God is mindful of you. God visits you. He cares about you. He's concerned about you. And he made you a little lower than the angels. You say, I thought man was superior to the angels. He is in the sense that of what God's ultimate plan is for him. But right now, the little there is either of degree or in time or a little bit of mixture of both. That at this current juncture in time, man dies. Angels don't die. And by the way, angels can't be redeemed. They're locked in their eternal state of either righteous angels or evil angels. It's, it's a done deal with them. Are you listening to me here this morning? But it's not a done deal with you. And the Bible says that death passed upon all men because sin entered into the world. And death by sin. So we cannot rule and reign on the earth if we're going to keep dying. Well, what do we do? Beloved pastor, okay, here's one option. Quit sinning. Okay, that's not going to work because you've already sinned enough to disqualify you from living forever on the earth. So there must be some other means. Okay, look at verse number seven. Everybody still doing all right or has anybody already checked out and gone to lunch? I mean, you're still physically here. I'm just checking to see if you're still engaged. Okay. He made him a little lower than the angels. Verse seven, crowned him with glory and honor. Hey, oh mercy, there's so much preaching in here. He's given you dignity. Don't let the world's philosophy take away the dignity that he made you and crowned you with glory and honor. You are not a blob that got a job one day. You were flopping around and then became something that could swim off and get legs and then arms and then climb trees and then get down and get a suit. No. 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 Forever no. It's no wonder that kids act like animals if we teach them that they came from animals. God crowns you with glory and honor. You're made in his image. You have dignity. That unborn child has dignity because God made him or her in the image of God. God made you in the image of God. That dear elderly person that, that is in the in re retirement home or the nursing home and they, they can't even feed themselves, they have dignity because God made them in his image. Amen. He cares for them. He loves them. He loves you. And he set us over his, that work of his hands in verse number seven. Verse number eight, he's put all things under the subjection under his feet. He put all things under him. I mean, three different times he's emphasizing. He's put everything under his feet. It made me think about my dad. In fact, I remember back in Genesis chapter one as I was preaching, it was on Father's Day and it just happened that it was, he made man in his image to have dominion and I thought about my dad. And I thought about how my dad tried to have dominion over everything, including us. Did a good job. He had dominion over the fish of the sea, crappie fishing, cat fishing, jug fishing, catfish traps, live bait, deep sea fishing, fowl of the air. He was a duck god on the, on the White River in Arkansas. Over the cattle or four-footed animals, horses, shoeing horses, uh, building a barn that, that we got to be a part of, digging water lines. Oh, my soul. Did we dig a bunch of water lines and bulldozing and bush, brush hogging and Am I, am I speaking anybody's language right here? Electric fences everywhere, and I'll guarantee you they do work. <laughs> they do. Camping out, getting our horses in a trailer that, that one time was a flatbed trailer, then a boat trailer, then a horse trailer, and putting that same trailer on a ferry to go across the river at Mammoth Cave. Saddling up and riding a horse that once was wild. Having dominion over the earth, the herbs and the trees, building a, building a house and, and clearing off land. To, to, he and my mom working even after they got off work to work and built a retaining wall about eight to ten foot high to keep part of that, that mountain, basically, or a hill coming in on us. And tomato plants and half barrels and PVC piping for strawberries and a four-wheeler path for his two sons and jinko trees and pine trees and Bradford pear trees 
trees and he was a lineman harnessing power and distributing heavy gauge wire and setting up services. He told me at that building and that building, that, that restaurant and working a high in a bucket truck and he did not pass on the not fear of heights to his son. It's not hereditary. <laughs> Climbing poles, training other men. He'd say, I'm not running a popularity campaign. I'm running truck 10. And then once he retired, he really got to working. Going to flea markets and, and taking these squirrel cage fans and selling them to farmers and buckets. And he had me watch, wash probably 10,000 buckets at one time. And these plastic barrels that were once at a juice company and he'd sell them, you know, for, for people to have either for water, for rain or whatever. And one lady asked, you know, could you use that barrel, that plastic barrel as a burn barrel? <laughs> he said, yes, ma'am. <laughs> one time. <laughs> and time would fail me about his effort to have dominion over creeping things, coon hounds and dogs and squirrels and rabbits and snakes. <laughs> he tried to rule, but sometimes he got ruled. How about you? We try the best to rule. And with all of our medical advances and all of our fitness programs and all of our improved living conditions, we're still not in control. Thank God for the police. Thank God for the help they are to bring things under civil control. Thank God for the military and the, the help that they give us in the world. And yet things are out of control. Thank God for politicians that lead in ways of righteous and try to bring control, but then we try to get some politicians back under control. Thank God for exterminators and repairmen and mechanics and doctors and undertakers. But all that just illustrates, originally and by God's design, we were designed to be in dominion and have control. And yet because of the entrance of sin that messes everything up, we're not in control. In many ways, we're under control. And that's why I said at the end of verse number eight, we see not all things under his control, under man's control. Is that right? You see that? Sure. We see not everything under man's control. But here's what we do see. Yes. This first time he mentions Jesus. In fact, it's almost like he's saying this, you know, everything right now is kind of chaotic, but I'll tell you what I do see. I see Jesus. But we see Jesus made a little lower than the angels. Hey, you know what he's saying right there? Yes, he is higher than the angels. Everybody agree with that? Yes, he's higher. He's superior to all the angels. But because of love for you, dear friend, he humbled himself and took on flesh like you and I have and became a man. The creator entered his creation and allowed them to strip him of his garments and to beat his back with a cat of nine tails and to pierce his body, putting him on a cross. And he hung there, suspended between heaven and earth, and he died in your place and my place. He had to become a man to die for you and me. Because as God is spirit, he could not die in that form. He became man. And the Bible says that he, what? Tasted death. What does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean that he took a little sip of it. The idea is that he fully experienced it for you and me. He tasted death. For every man, the Bible is so abundantly clear that he's the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Amen. He died for every single man. That means every single person can be saved if they would be saved. That brings us to verse 10, the conclusion of the message. Verse 10 really goes with the next unit, but I'd like to include it here. It says it became him. In other words, it was fitting. It was appropriate. In fact, in many ways, we could even say it this way. It was necessary. It became him. It was the only way. 
It was the only way. Somebody had to get to us. Thank God he wanted to. Thank God this is not an afterthought with God. No, he cares about you so much that he intentionally came after you even after you were a sinner. To save you and then to help you live a Genesis 1 and 2 life in a Genesis 3 world where you're not dominated by your past. Not dominated by your past. Not dominated by your emotions. Not dominated by a sinful, wicked culture. But living life the way that God originally designed you. To fellowship with him. And to righteously lead a family, to lead a life that would bring honor and glory to the one that saved you. It became him. It became him, it says. It became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things. Watch this. In bringing many sons to glory. To make the captain, oh, that word captain, bringing many sons to glory. The captain means this, the forerunner, the, the one that goes ahead to bring others on that way. In fact, we might even say it this way, the pioneer. The one who blazed a trail. The one who went ahead of us in the ideas that many others would come along with him. It's used of a man that would start a city so that others could inhabit that city. It's used of a father of a family that others, the, the originator of a family, the, the, the one that got it started so that others could join that family. It's, that's our Savior. He's the one that while we were in trouble, he took, he's the one, as Barclay uses this analogy, that as the ship was going down, he's the one that, that, that swam out and took a line so that others could be saved. Same idea. It's used in that Greek, Greek culture. But basically, it's communicating this. For you and I to fulfill God's original design, Jesus came to restore what was lost by sin. For you to fulfill God's original design for you, Jesus came to restore what you messed up and what I messed up by my sin. Because sin distorts our lives and robs you of your dignity. Am I telling the truth today, church? Thank God he came to restore you. Jacob and Haley, I think, I think y'all go ahead and get married. With God's help, it's going to be all right. Listen to me. Not that you're, we're taking a church vote on this right now. <laughs> They're living in a wicked culture, aren't they? There's all kinds of pressures on a Christian couple to have, live a Christian life and have a Christian home. But God will be a help to you because Jesus has already gone ahead of you to restore what you and I have messed up. And God's plan for marriage, it'll work. God's plan for male and female, it still works. God's plan for working a job still works. God's plan for church still works. I mean, you name it, God's plan for finances still works. We live in a fallen world. Yes, yes, yes. But he came to restore what we messed up by sin. And he paid the price for you and for me. He came to rescue us. That's what he's saying right here. He came to restore us. You don't have to be ruled by sin and shame and your past or present wicked culture. Through Jesus, you can live. But, but I, I want to say it very clearly here. It's only through Jesus that you can live a Genesis 1 and 2 life in a Genesis 3 world. Father, thank you this morning that the exalted Son of God humbled himself and became man that he might redeem us unto yourself. And that through Jesus, that which is lost, those who are lost can be restored. That by the grace of God, it says here that you tasted death for every man. 
Oh, may we not take that for granted. Thank you, Lord, for coming to restore us. I pray for any here that don't know you as Savior. And I, I pray also for those that are saved, but they're ruled by lust or desires <clears throat> or things of this world. Lord, please help us all to live according to your original design. In Jesus' name, amen.